let me turn now to Arthur Brooks, who is patiently waiting. Arthur became president of the American Enterprise Institute in 2009. AEI is, of course, one of the nation's most important research institutions, known for its commitment to expanding liberty, increasing individual opportunity, and strengthening free enterprise, and known, too, as the home base for many nationally important scholars and as a font of creative policy proposals. In think tank years, AEI goes back almost to the Cambrian period when trilobites roamed the seas, more precisely to 1938, when, as now, the ideals of democratic capitalism, limited government, private enterprise, and individual liberty were overshadowed by an aggressive and expansive executive branch. Arthur Brooks became AEI's president just in time to deal with the Great Recession, the stimulus, and the raft of policy changes, including the Affordable Care Act that ensued with President Obama's election. He has guided AEI extraordinarily well through these challenges. Arthur is a man of many parts. He received his PhD in policy analysis from the Rand Graduate School in 1998, but this came after a professional career as a French hornist, first with the Annapolis Brass Quintet, and then as the associate principal French hornist with the City, University, City Orchestra pardon, of Barcelona. He also taught at the Herod Conservatory before his astonishing switch from a musical instrument to the instruments of statecraft. He rose quickly in his second career to a full professorship at Syracuse University in 2005 and a named chair of business and government policy in 2007. The rapidity of his ascent was propelled by an outpouring of important and well-received books in the emerging field of behavioral economics, among them Who Really Cares, Social Entrepreneurship, Gross National Happiness, and most recently The Road to Freedom, How to Win the Fight for Free Enterprise. Here to explain why the road to freedom is not to be confused with the woodland path favored by the campus sustainability movement, please welcome Arthur Brooks. Thank you, Peter. That's a very generous introduction. I'm delighted to be with all of you today. Congratulations on the, publish, the publication of this important report, something that you're all very interested in, the nexus of bad ideas on campuses and bad ideas in government. Uh, boy, oh boy, there's sure a lot to think about um, these days. And it, some days you think it's getting worse. Well, thank God for the National Association of Scholars. This is an organization that I came across in my last year of graduate school when I was about to go on the market as a college professor. And, I looked around and I thought, boy, is, is there actually a path for me? Is there a place for me? Is there anybody who agrees with me out there? And I felt like I was going to echo, 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 echo. And the National Association of Scholars was, in fact, there. Um, the, the inception of my own organization, the American Enterprise Institute, which I came to much later, um, actually, in, in a way, matches the same set of mission values of the National Association of Scholars. In 1938, when AEI was founded, it was founded right here in New York City before it moved to Washington. By, by Hayekian business types, people from the National uh, Association of Manufacturers. And, and the reason they founded AEI was because of what was going on in academia. Now, none of us remember this, but if we look back at the history books, we can see very clearly that 1938 was arguably the worst out year of the Great Depression. The economic growth rate was minus 4%. This is the ninth year of the Great Depression, minus 4%. It's science fiction to us today. This would be like the year 2017, still having a negative rate of growth. Well, the answer to this, the solution to this from academic economists uniformly at Princeton and Harvard and Yale and all the best universities in America was scientific socialism. The idea that we needed to engineer public administration and the economy more precisely well, people in business rejected that. They said, no, that's actually wrong. And AEI, my institution, which has been around now for more than 75 years, was founded on the premise that, in point of fact, the Great Depression was prolonged by bad government policy, and furthermore, that the administration in Washington was using the continuing misery as a pretext to turn the American people away from the free enterprise system culturally. Does that sound familiar? The wolf is always at the door, which is why AEI continues to exist, which is why the National Association of Scholars continues to exist. That's why this work is important and that we all have to continue supporting it. Congratulations for what you're doing. And for those of you who are donors to NAS, 
I congratulate you on your wisdom in doing so and, and encourage you to continue to do it. Um, as Peter mentioned, it, being the president of AEI is not my first career, not even my second career. Um, I was an academic, I was at Syracuse for a long time, writing obscure uh, papers on genetic algorithms and, and uh, simulations of art markets and weird stuff like that. And, and as a behavioral economist, I came across this, this uh, subject that I was most interested in, which is philanthropy, which is the, sort of the behavior of people giving things away. And I wrote a book on it, it was my first trade book, and I didn't expect anybody to pay attention to it, and I got a call, and it was from John Stossel's producer, John's here. And that call changed my career. Why? Because John did a show on that book and it wrecked my life. So, because <laughs> the, yeah. the show was on TV and then my colleagues saw it and they realized that I was some sort of big right winger and so I said, okay, forget it. And I started writing for the Wall Street Journal at that point and the rest, as they say, is history. Um, and I'm no longer welcome back. The, but that, that journey to the American Enterprise Institute was really important for not just academic reasons, not just professional reasons. It was important for moral reasons. And this is where we get to the main topic of today, which is not environmental sustainability, it's moral sustainability for the people who need it the most. When I was back in the music business, which I did for 12 years full time, uh, I dropped out of college when I was 19, you know, dropped out, kicked out, split in hairs. And <laughs> And I started traveling around, and I saw all 50 states from the back of a van. It was a great time. I was barely making rent. In those days, when I finally wound up in the Barcelona Orchestra, I had a favorite composer. And it's a composer that all of you know, because it's, he's the most famous composer in history. Even if you don't like classical music, you know Johann Sebastian Bach. Right? Popularly understood to be the greatest genius of the high Baroque. On my worst days, and there were plenty of bad days when I was playing in the orchestra, I would listen to Bach, and it was, a great, it was a great source of solace and intellectually really vibrant and interesting to me as well. Now, one of the things that you note about Bach was his productivity. Bach published more than 1,000 works in his 65 years. He, he lived between 17, 1685 and 1750. More than 1,000 pieces, orchestra, chamber works, choral works, keyboard works, incredible. He also had, by the way, 20 kids. That's productive, right? <laughs> and Bach, uh, near the end of his life, he was not that famous during his life. He became very famous 100 years after he died because another composer named Felix Mendelssohn discovered his manuscripts. But during his life, he was well known as a teacher. And a, a minor biographer for posterity was recording facts about Bach, the, the, the relatively well-known teacher's life. And he asked him a question. And that question really struck me and it never left my head. The question was this, why do you write music? Now, that's a weird question when you think about it, right? I mean, how, people ask you all the time, what do you do for a living? Nobody ever asks you, why do you do it, right? It's like, and, and, and I got thinking, you know, why do I do what I do? You want to know what Bach's answer was, by the way? Bach's answer was not a 30-minute exegesis on the nature of music. It was not which intellectuals and artists tend to do. It wasn't something flippant like, I got 20 kids, I gotta pay the rent, that's why I write music, which might have been my answer if I were him. Hmm. It was this, the final end and aim of all music is nothing less than the glory of God and the enjoyment of man. Hmm. Now, in other words, the glory of God and the good of mankind, that's the why of my music. I asked myself, hmm, if somebody came up to me in those years and said, Brooks, why do you play the French horn? Would my answer be, the glory of God and the good of mankind? <laughs> Not likely. I mean, let us leave aside the glory of God because that's hard and personal, but the good of mankind, we can all get our minds around that no matter what your religious views. Later when I was in academia, which was an incredibly fun and satisfying career, I loved, I loved every year of that, by the way, when I was in academia, I remember thinking of it again and, and wondering if somebody came to me and said, Brooks, why do you teach economics at Syracuse University? Would my answer have been, for the good of mankind? No, I don't think it would have been. And then I came to AEI in the heart of the Great Recession, three weeks before the inauguration of Barack Obama. Huh. In the worst statist 
threat to the American economy since the Great Depression. And I asked myself, if somebody asked me, why are you the president of AEI? Would I say, for the good of mankind? The answer is yes. For the first time in my life, the answer is yes. And I'm going to tell you why. It's about not economic growth. It's not about tax rates. It's not about any of the gears of public policy. It's about poor people. And let me tell you the story. The greatest story, humanistic story, anti-poverty story in the history of mankind. Here's how it goes. When I was a little kid in 1970 or 71 or something, I remember the first experience I had with poverty. And I grew up in a lower middle class household in Seattle. And if you looked at it by today's standards, it would be poor. But that was nothing compared to the poverty I first saw. And you saw this too. Do you remember the first time you saw a picture of a kid in sub-Saharan Africa in the National Geographic magazine? And the kid had a distended belly and flies on his face. You remember that? And you knew that that kid was going to die and there was nothing you could do. right? And you thought to yourself, it's not fair that I'm all right, and I'm comfortable, and I'm happy, and I'm loved. And that kid, through no fault of his own, is going to starve to death. That was a big cognitive moment for millions of Americans about the same time that I had that experience. Well, I grew up, and you grew up, and we went to school, and we dropped in, and we dropped out, and we got married and started our jobs, and all life went forward, right? But occasionally, I thought of, and maybe you did too, what happened to that kid? Hmm? And you can't know specifically, so what happened to people that poor since we were kids? We know the answer. We know the answer. And that's what I figured out when I was in the music business, because I started to study economics, and that's the reason I became an economist, and the reason I became a conservative, is the answer to the question of what happened to that kid. Let me tell you what happened to that kid. Since 1970 until today, the percentage of the world's population living at the edge of starvation, living on a dollar a day or less adjusted for inflation, the percentage of the world's population that's that poor since 1970 has declined by 80%, an 80% decline in the world's worst poverty. It's like a state secret. Nobody knows this. 70% of Americans think there's more hunger in the world than when we were kids. They're not just wrong, they're completely wrong. This is the greatest anti-poverty achievement in the history of humanity, and it's happened in the lifetimes of almost everybody sitting in this room, and most people don't even know it. Two billion people have been pulled out of starvation level poverty since we were kids. You gotta have an answer, because if you can't explain why, you can't replicate it. And if you can't replicate it, you can't save more people. So the first question is, what did that? Was it just some weird coincidence of factors? Why is it that all the way through history, we haven't been able to wipe out poverty, and then suddenly, in modern times, poor people started being a lot less poor? And billions of them were not at the edge of starvation. It's a miracle. OK, ask people around here. Down on the street, you're going to hear, it's the success of the United Nations. <laughs> That's like a laugh line in here, right? You know, and we're so close to the United Nations right now, I got the heebie-jeebies, right? I mean, you and I know that it's not that. Look, like it or, like it or hate it, my, my purpose here is not to trash the United Nations. If you want, we can do that in the Q&A period. Um, that's not the point. The point is, it's not the United Nations that did that. It's not the International Monetary Fund. It's not the World Bank. It's not central planning and global socialism. Mm -mm. You know what it is? It's five things that pulled two billion people out of poverty. Globalization, free trade, property rights, the rule of law, and entrepreneurship. It was the American free enterprise system that saved two billion people. People ask us all the time. You know, you conservatives. So all you care about money? <laughs> what do you mean is that all I care about? It's two billion people. Capitalism built that. You built that, to coin a phrase. Huh. So what do we do about that? How do we get more of that? Well, to begin with, we got to stand up for it. 
And don't just stand up for it because free enterprise is mathematically the most efficient method to create great wealth here in the United States. Not just because it makes rich people richer, which it does. It's because it makes poor people not poor. Economic growth matters, and it only happens systematically among the poor with free enterprise, and only with our efforts can it become sustainable. That's the sustainability that matters morally, and that's the only sustainability that matters morally if you're poor. Now, you got to ask yourself when you go on college campuses, don't they love poor people? What are they missing here? It's not that they don't love poor people. We don't want to be ad hominem. We don't want to doubt the moral motives. We don't want to say that something bad is written on their hearts. The problem is this. They don't understand. And the reason they don't understand what I just said is because we've never explained it right. We're bad at communications. We're not serious about talking to people in completely uh, humanistic terms that describe the principles of true global brotherhood. And until we do that, we're going to keep losing. And sustainability is going to be some stupid set of rent-seeking, cronyistic boondoggles all about not buying stocks in certain companies and divesting from certain countries. And you know that's the truth. So what are we going to do? What's the principle that we have to live by to get true sustainability across to more people? Yesterday, just yesterday, I turned in the manuscript for a new book to my publisher and it was only a month late, right? which is like a miracle in the, public, in the publishing industry. And my editor is a guy named Adam Bello at HarperCollins. He's acting mad at me, but I know he's actually really happy because he got it two months before he thought he was going to get it. <laughs> and um, the, this book, which is going to come out in July, God willing, this book is basically my solution about how to talk, about how to make the sale about how to talk to people, about how to actually talk about what's written on your heart. And here's the big idea that's in that book, talking to lots of conservatives and traveling around the country and giving 150 speeches a year, and most importantly, working with the Republican leaders on the Hill day in and day out. What do they do wrong? What do they do wrong? The answer is this. They fight against things, and they don't fight for people. That's the secret. So, Back when Newt Gingrich won in 1994, that revolutionary victory where the House was overtaken by Republicans for the first time in 40 years, um, everybody talked about what a visionary he is. And when I first got to know him several years ago, I asked him, what was the biggest problem that you had? See, that's always the interesting question. If I want to know, if I want to learn something about my life from you, something I can use, I can go to any single person in this room, and if I only have 30 seconds, you know what I'm going to ask you? Tell me about the worst day of your life and what you learned from it. And you're going to tell me something that's going to be really interesting for my life. Right? So I always go to leaders, visionary leaders, and the first question I ask them is, tell me the biggest problem that you had after a certain event. And that's why I asked Newt Gingrich. What was the biggest problem that you had after the 1994 revolution? You know what he told me? He didn't say, it's, it wasn't you know, a hostile press or a recalcitrant president from the opposite party. He said, no, no, no. He said, it was my Republican majority. They still thought they were a minority. Right? They still acted like they were a minority. They, st people, he, they acted in such a way that the American public still treated them like a minority. Huh. So what do you mean? So think about it like this way. A minority in a democratic system is the opposition. The opposition opposes things. It opposes the things that come from the other side. It fights against things. Therefore, if you want people to think that you're a minority, fight against things, and it creates cognitive triggers in the American brain to say, you are a minority. You are not a majority. What does a majority do? A majority doesn't fight against things. A majority fights for people. And this is the way for us to talk about capitalism now and hereafter. Don't fight against the bad policies of a social democratic European president. Don't fight against the, the predations of the Obama administration. Fight for the people that are suffering from these policies. You don't like Obamacare? Neither do I. Don't fight against Obamacare. Fight for the victims of Obamacare. You don't like teachers unions? Neither do I. Don't fight against teachers unions. Fight for the kids who are being marginalized by teachers unions because they're poor. That's what we need to do. Always keep 
the person you're fighting for front and center in your head. We do that, we don't just have better ideas. We have better ideas wrapped around a social movement that expresses the American heart and brings America to true unity to lift people up who are the most vulnerable members of society. That's the true sustainability movement economically. And that's the true moral movement that is the conservative heart, my heart and many of yours. Thank you.